Okay, we are going to get started. I want to give a big round of applause to both our panelists and to you for closing out Absolutely. this event. Yes. Give yourself a round of applause. At four, almost 4.30 on a Friday, I mean, that is a real tip of the hat. And I always like to think it's at our smaller panels when it's not as robust of an audience that it, it really does take the energy and the wherewithal. So thank you for being here. Um, this is Where Value-Based Care is Headed and How to Think Differently About Risk. I'm Molly Gamble with Beckers. Delighted to welcome our two panelists to this topic and hear from them and also to hear from you. So one benefit of having a smaller group is that it's easier to see raised hands. Um, if there's any questions or topics you'd like our panelists to speak to, please do that and I'll, I'd love to add your voice to the conversation. Uh, I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce themselves and we'll get started. So Dr. McCauley, I'm gonna to turn to you first, then we'll hear from your co-panelist. All right, thank you, and thank you again for joining us late on a Friday, really happy that you're here. Peter McCauley, medical officer with Cigna Healthcare. I've been with Cigna in various roles of increasing responsibility for the last 14 years. In my current role as medical officer, I have overall responsibility for our value-based relationships across the country. We have 240 large physician group collaboratives based in primary care across 34 states, covering 32 million commercial lives. And we have right around 500 other value-based arrangements across various specialties. I'm a pediatrician. This is my 33rd year in practice. For the last 25 years, I've been a volunteer at a federally qualified community health center on the far south side of Chicago. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kumar? I feel like every time I hear Dr. McCauley speak, I fangirl all over again. So um, it's overwhelming being on a panel with him, but excited to be here. Thank you for still being here. Sorry, we're a bit we knew and a glass of wine or whatever your choice of poison is, but hope to make this fun. Um, I'm an internist by trade. I've been in healthcare about 25 years, managed care 14. Um, actually, I've done a st uh, stint at Cigna in my past. My current role, I'm the market-facing me medical executive for the family of companies. I'm with Independence Blue Cross for the five-county Philly Regional Blue Plan, um, and I just took on responsibility for pharmacy services as a PNL. So excited to be here. I truly believe that you know we have to move to value from um, doing more to actually doing what's right for our members, for the patients, and um, with value-based care, hopefully we will start to change the paradigm and, and shift it to where we're moving towards health rather than spending all our resources on sort of chronic disease and end stage of life. So excited to be here. We as payers can't do it alone. It has to be done in collab collaboration with providers. Um, and looking forward to sharing with you what we're doing in our market. Thank you so much. I, I, I guess you know my first question, uh, and just a, a panel in the past hour was on ACOs, and so coming from the media side, especially health systems, is where I spent a lot of time. It was so interesting. Early aughts, you saw so much attention and energy around value-based care, at least in the press. Um, systems coming forward saying, by this date, we want to have this much of our revenue at risk or in value-based care models. Um, it's kind of quieted down, and I think we'll get to some of the pandemic's effects of it, but let's start by just getting a lay of the land. Um, how would you rate the appetite for value-based care among providers, payers, and employers on a scale of 1 to 10, if you will, uh, 1 being totally apathetic and, and 10 being a roaring insistence for it? Dr. McCauley, how, how do you see that those three stakeholders? Oh, there's, there's a lot in that question. With the provider side, I probably would give the provider community a seven. Okay. I think that providers are really interested in any system that allows them to experience less administrative burden. It allows them to be equipped with data and information to help address the needs of their patients and allows them to deliver on the treatment plans that they lay out for their patient population. I think that there is significant recognition that the fee-for-service train in the United States is coming to the station. And you know, by and large, I think providers are willing to stand by their work, and that's really what value-based care is about, delivering a better experience and better healthcare outcomes over time for costs that are more reasonable. From the employer standpoint, 
I probably would give employers an eight or an 8.5. I had the good fortune on Monday and Tuesday of this week to be locked into a room for the better part of those days with 10 of Cigna's largest national accounts, the likes of Harris Teeter, Southwest Airlines, and uh, Stanley Black & Decker, for example. They didn't say, Dr. McCauley, we want you to push more value-based care. What they say is, we want care that's administered in a timely manner so that diagnoses are made early, treatment is rendered in a method, at a place, and a time that our employees find it convenient, and the employee's health status is better after that encounter than it was initially. And of course, we want a system that's going to drive our costs down. They don't necessarily ask for value-based care, but they ask for the format of value-based care. And the third part of the question? Providers, payers, and payers, sorry. Well, I'm a little partial on the yeah. payer standpoint. Yeah. We are actually doubled, doubling down with regard to our approach to value-based care. We've been in the space now for the past 15 years and we're rapidly iterating on our value-based care models to make them more attractive to the provider community to carve out a larger slice of pie. I think many of you know that we partnered with Walgreens last year in the purchase of Village MD, and that gives us a platform to look at that asset in a way that we can scale it and accelerate their approach to value-based care, which is really quite sophisticated as it is. We're excited about the way forward, and we're all in. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. That So seven for providers, eight and eight and a half for employers, payers. Sounds like you're biased, so it'll be high. I'm assuming nine, nine, ten. Ten, ten. ten. okay. There we go. Uh, Dr. Kumar, how would you? How, how do your assessments differ from Dr. McCauley's? I, I would say payers is definitely a ten. Yeah. Um, our Willingness to want to have a value-based arrangement is always at the table and as aggressive as possible. I feel like we all hear the word value-based care. On the employer side, you know, helping people understand what does that mean. Yeah. Um, and value-based care goes all the way from, you know, just an upside incentive to truly taking an upside-downside, truly taking risk. Um, and there's different versions of it based on the appetite of the provider or how large a system they are, how, much, how many patients do they have, how familiar they are with the value-based model, and, and do they have systems in place to be able to use data analytics to actually drive to the outcomes or not. Um, a lot of times we'll start with an upside and build in downside risk over, you know, over the contract, periods of the contract. And we're doing that with vendors as well. So I, I'd say there's another layer in the ecosystem is point solutions and vendors, right? Um, and we're trying to put, build value-based agreements with them. I would say payers are definitely a 10. Um, vendors, I would say point solutions are probably at a 6 or a 7. They're eager to. The challenge becomes there's so many people in that ecosystem that are all driving to the same outcomes as to how do you slice that pie and who truly drew, the, you know, drove the change. So it becomes a true actuarial um, exercise to have to evaluate, you know, how how you're going to do the math there. Um, employers are definitely interested. There's a version of what we do with employers in our products and solutions where we're giving guarantees and we're giving ROIs for our solutions. So that is also a type of value-based care, um, not your traditional, you know, how you're paying the provider per se, but that's how you, how they're paying us. Um, and I think where self-funded is probably going to be headed and would love to hear your perspective, Dr. McCauley, but, you know, I feel like self-funded is also going to go in that direction where employers are going to start to look at us as pairs. And, you know, there's a lot of pairs out there. There's a lot of competition. They could go with the Blue. They could go with Cigna. They could go with Aetna. They could go with United. Is um, rather than admin fee, like, can you take risk and give, give me guarantees on trends? And, and can you actually take outcomes-based uh, mm -hmm. risks and shared savings models, mm -hmm. et cetera? So I think that's where it's going to head, even with employers. Yeah. Um, is, but there, is there a specific example you could share of how that could play out with an employer coming back to their health plan or their payer and saying, can you do just what you described just now? Can you give it a story around that or an example? So we're already, we're already 
having those kinds of conversations, because yeah. even as a pair, right, um, there's a lot that we do in order to drive value, in order to drive outcomes, um, and there's a lot we spend in order to do that, whether that's with um, people, services, infrastructure that we build, right, it's, it's, it's an admin cost. Um, we can't keep hiking our admin fee with employers because then we're basically pricing ourselves out of the market. So we're having conversations now saying, how about we deliver to outcomes? How about we deliver to your gaps in care being closed, your cancers being diagnosed early, your services being rendered in the less costly setting? So it's, it's about site of service. Um, and all those programs that are delivering savings Let's figure out what that saving that was delivered was, and it, it's not an admin fee, but you know maybe it's a shared saving model. Okay. Some of it's already happening. Where I see it go, probably in the next ten plus years, is um, the bigger employers, the national ones, are going to probably push push the sort of envelope more on on having us be ready at the table to mm -hmm. to be creative in how we start partnering with them. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, I, a follow-up question, I think, based on something you said, Dr. McCauley, about providers, you, you put their appetite at seven, noting that one facet of value-based care that could agree, appeal to them is the lower administrative burden. And this is an exceptional time to be talking about that, right, given some of the staffing, all the staffing crises and the exodus right of providers and burnout since pa the pandemic. Do you think there's an opportunity there for some some rebranding or for that to be the foot that leads in the conversation with providers or, or do you eventually hit a wall that I'm not aware of? I don't know that it has to be the lead in to get yeah. providers to engage, but everyone is looking for value. And you, you heard it earlier today, providers are contracted with a number of health plans. Do they want to have 15 metrics for 15 different health plans? Do they want to have eight different UM providers within the health plans that they're servicing. They're looking for things that will help them to do better, that will ease their life, that will make their daily practice more efficient. And you mentioned earlier um, staffing shortages. Part of that is because of burnout. Mm -hmm. If there is a way that we're able to shift responsibilities, like for example, utilization management, if you're interested in taking the risk, why do I need to have you come and ask me a question every time if you're responsible for that? There are ways that we need to continue to leverage technology to help the processes be more efficient when we are engaged in that. But why not figure out a way to share that responsibility and really kind of just make the pathway easier? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, I what, agree with that, yeah. What is, and, oh, go ahead, Dr. Kumar. We're actually doing, we're, I think all of us are doing some of some version of that in our markets. We've got provider groups, you you know, whether it's big orthopedics groups or big um, heart failure groups or um, academic medical centers, where they've literally taken risk on the total cost of care for the patients that they're seeing. Or there's bundled models around services, whether there's a bundle around heart failure with requirements of keeping people out of hospitals and ERs and managing them aggressively mm -hmm. in the office setting, or MSK bundles where you know the surgery is happening in the outpatient setting and not everybody's going to that rehab that that hospital owns. So it's different versions of how we're incentivizing them to lower costs and add value while paying attention to high quality outcomes. But um, everybody's at the table with incentives being aligned, sure. and, and that's how we're starting to make a change. Okay. And then just to continue, and this will be, the, I think, my last landscape or lay of the land question, but when we talk about risk, what what is the highest percentage of risk or the most is, extreme version of risk on the provider side look to you? Um, what does that look like? You don't need to name a specific organization, but I'm just curious if there's percentage of revenue you can share or other models that just fulfill that description. I... Uh in my travels this week, had the occasion to have dinner with a couple of groups in Texas, and fairly large independent groups, very engaged in up and downside risk, 70%, 80%. Keeping in mind that that includes Medicare Advantage, that still demonstrates an appetite for risk, and those groups have the capabilities and the infrastructure in order to address 
everything from A to Z. And I think that that translates into a bigger appetite mm -hmm. to really um, take responsibility from end to end. And when you're equipped and you can do that, that's really what providers want. Okay. Dr. Kumar, 70 to 80% was? Yeah, we, we've, we've got folks that are at full risk. Okay. Um, and I'll give you one example. One of the big health systems in our market has a 30-day all-cause readmission guarantee with us. So irrespective of why, if a patient goes back a second time within 30 days, they only get paid for that first Sentinel admission. Mm -hmm. And they eat the cost of every single other admission. So what that has done is the intensity and the collaboration and sort of that holistic view that happens at point of discharge and the and the transitions of care, um, that's that's been intensified for, for our members where they've taken that risk. And so they're aligned to keep these patients healthy and out of hospitals, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise they're eating the cost of that admission. Mm -hmm. So that's one extreme version of it. Um, behavioral health space, we have certain risk-based models around um, alcohol uh, detox places and drug abuse um, and substance use disorder um, where there's case rates. And basically the centers where we've got those models in place, we have really high recid recidivism rates and extremely low readmissions. So we, we know and we see it in our data, the value-based care works, mm -hmm. but it truly starts working and you really start to see that drastic improvement in your outcomes and your results when you've got downside risk baked in. Um, well, thanks for laying the land. I think, you know, the title of our session, Where Value-Based Care is Headed and How to Think Differently About Risk. Are there two to three ways you would suggest that our attendees in the room think differently about risk? Are there any assumptions that need to be challenged, um, any blind spots we should be better aware of? Ch help us challenge our thinking. Dr. McCauley, what comes to mind? There are a couple of things. First of all, I think risk means different things to different people. And we have to, out of the gate, recognize that risk is not going to be the same for one provider group as it is for others. Does that include, for example, only primary care capitation? Or is it uh, primary cap with um, fee-for-service for specialists? Or maybe primary care physicians are incentivized to keep services in the primary care office that might otherwise go to a specialist? Do you subcap some specialties? Or is it, is it full risk? To start out, we need to recognize that risk means different things to different people. And then the other thing that I would say is that risk in 2023 is not the same as risk is in 1993. We now have the ability to exchange data and information that gives line of sight to those individual patients within a group that are at risk to either develop a chronic condition or end up in the hospital or at risk for readmission. And that data and information allows the providers to act in a manner that previously they might have had a difficult, a more difficult pathway to because they simply didn't have line of sight to understanding that. I think that we still need to encourage physicians to understand that risk is not necessarily bad and as I said earlier, I think by and large, if you ask the provider community, are you willing to stand by your work? Are your patients better at time B than they were at time A? And if they are, and there's a reasonable opportunity for reimbursement, no, no reason to be risk adverse. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Kumar, what would you add? I would say um, that we, we see that today, right? Everybody's appetite for risk is different, and it, it truly doesn't depend on the size of the practice. There's some big institutions that are risk averse, um, but it's also a population mix. Where we've seen, um, you know, managed care Medicare is where entities that take full risk that have figured out how to make it work, um, right? Um, it allows them the ability to bring services that are not traditional healthcare services to the table to help solve for whether it's social determinants of health and challenges to truly get that 
individual to be healthy, stay healthy, stay safely home? Is it meals? Is it transportation? So I think risk also allows um, you to think cre creatively by mm -hmm. knowing that you, you're going to have an extra sum of money to work with, then you have the ability to invest that in the right things for to make sure that your population's improving. Um, so it's it's different versions of it. I've seen it evolve over the last 14 years in managed care, um, but I, I still think there's um, there's a long way to go for all of us. Sure. But once we we're at a place where everybody's taking risks, then we can take away all the policing that we have to do, right? UM is in a perceived abrasion for everybody. Uh, providers don't like it, patients don't like it. I call it a necessary evil. Um, UM isn't there, util utilization management isn't there. Just, you know, nobody gets told to sit and deny things. We're trying to make sure what is being done for our patients, our members, is truly evidence-based, uh, is truly gonna improve their outcomes, and it's in the best setting. Um, you give a drug in the hospital outpatient setting, it could be four times the cost, of giving that same drug at the same dose in a professional setting. So have for entities that are bearing full risk, they're already moving the treatments to the output, to the professional setting because it's less costly while you're not impacting outcomes. For entities that are not, they're not doing that and we have to put programs in place to do that. So, you know, my ideal world would be where everybody takes full risk. Um, we as payers truly enable with data analytics, um, member-specific real-time data to empower providers, um, physicians, clinicians to be able to do what's needed for that patient timely to truly impact outcomes, but that we, have, we don't have to do the policing. Um, and so the admin burden on all sides sort of goes away. Mm -hmm. Any questions for our panelists so far? Oh, I see a couple of hands going up. Yes, sir. Right. We'll start with yours, and I think we'll move up here and then get back to yours, sir. Go ahead. A two to three year churn for commercial value based. I'm trying to re restrain my response, so I'm going to yield to my colleague and then I'll jump in. <laughs> I, I was doing the same thing. So I, I would say, you know, maybe maybe 10 years ago, um, I saw that viewpoint a lot more with employers, like even investing in population health management solutions, disease management. It was the same sort of, you know, um, but if the person's with me just two years, why would I invest in this, right? Um, it's, it's about everybody everybody gains from it when you do the right thing, right? And we have value-based models for all our members, ex irrespective of whether those are Medicare members or commercial members, um, because what that allows is it allows for practitioners to have high quality practicing, right? They, they practice at a higher level. Um, they follow pathways and guidelines and evidence-based practices that that go across the board where they're not gonna do something different just because it's a Medicare member and oh, I don't care about you you're, because you're a commercial member. So to me, Medicare is an example of, you know, incentivizing quality and outcomes, right? With, with stars, as painful as it can be to try and keep raising, they keep raising the bar and you have to keep r rising to meet that bar. But 
there's as much churn on the government programs where there are members that go from plan to plan every year or especially even on the Medicaid, Medicaid side. So I feel like I'll take the broader approach of it's the right thing to do. Um, so we do it. And we're seeing employers start to invest in programs that you know you may not see an ROI in the first two years. You're going to start to see that ROI year three, year four, year five. But it's the right thing to do to try and manage health and improve literacy. I would agree with that. And I would really push back a little bit on the term churn. And the reason is because if you think about it, the payer, in this case Cigna, for example, and the provider, they have the same incentive. We don't want to start over from scratch every two or three years. And you're absolutely right. You start to um, really get engagement and revenue after two years, three years. We don't want to lose clients. We want to keep clients. So we want the experience with Cigna to be optimal so that they tell their employer, we want you to keep Cigna. And on the other hand, in a practice, do I want to start over? I don't. I want the patients that I see to tell their friends, their relatives, their neighbors, you should go to see Dr. McCauley. I want to build that practice. I want to engage the patients and I want to keep them. And if the payer and the provider are working together for the benefit of the patient, I believe that it can help to offset that risk of patients moving around. And when patients make noise, employers listen. We know that when there's something that goes wrong. <laughs> we hear about it. We know it. it all the time, but yeah. it's also true when things go right. Everybody wins in value-based care. That's the question. I'm gonna try and go in order as I see hands raised. So you were next in the third, second row here. Go ahead. He needs a new job. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just, <laughs> just for anyone in the back, it was a, a, how do you influence employers to give proper time off so people can participate in value-based care in an 8-to-5 medical system? So uh, I, w I would say we're, we work with employers and we're constantly looking at, you know, how many of your employees are utilizing their benefits? What percentage actually have primary care? What are your gaps in care? And then we actually share what's best practice. And, and those employers where those numbers look really good, where the trends are actually really strong, where the trends aren't double digits, and we're almost seeing, in some cases, despite the inflation, a possible negative trend, we'll share with them examples of what those employers have done that has moved the needle and helped them keep their employees healthy. So I think you've got to show them the dynamic of, this is a worthwhile investment in your people because your second most costly um, sort of cost to you as an employer is what you spend on healthcare, especially if they're self-funded. Um, we also share what, what we do as an organization for our employees. Our employees get extra time off to go get their screenings done. You get a full day off to go get a colonoscopy, people, um, and a nice nap while you do it. But you get half a day for mammograms. So we share those practices as well. But we actually show them the data with the people that are doing it and how, what, how that's impacting their trends and how that's impacting their, their employees using their benefits. And that helps. The other thing that I would add is working with the employer to understand explicitly what their needs are and allowing us to leverage our resources like an MD Live, for example, that allows virtual care, telephonic care, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, primary care, dermatology, chronic care management as well. And then making sure that the employer understands geographically other resources that are available, like minute clinics, for example, or urgent care. We have to be as custom as possible to meet the needs of the employer. We're sitting here in Chicago. In Chicago, the largest client for Cigna right now is the Chicago Transit Authority. There are people at the CTA. Someone is working 24 hours a day, seven, seven days. days a week, 365 days a year. 
we have to be equipped either through the plan or through the provider group that has virtual care embedded within that provider group. And it's our responsibility to make sure that the client knows those resources and how to use them. That's actually a really good point. Um, we've got almost every welfare fund in Philly is, is our employer group. So it's these are the unions. And if you take a day off, you don't get paid, right? Uh, so for them, it's also these creative solutions. Is, this, is there virtual care solutions available? So during your lunch hour, you can actually schedule your appointment with virtual primary care, get that appointment done. And now there's solutions that we're making available where they will come to your home to get your labs or you'll get a kit sent home and you can get your labs and send, send it out. So it's also the consumerism of healthcare, right? Gone are the days where you have to schlep yourself to a brick and mortar facility in order to get care. Now you can get care where you are um, that meets you where you are. So we're, we're also investing a lot in making sure that we've got robust virtual care resources um, in almost every specialty that Dr. McCauley named so that you know, folks can continue to get the care that they need um, and stay healthy while it doesn't disrupt life as such. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Sir, I think, yes, you had a question back here. I think patient reported metrics are going to be important in behavioral health as well. But, you know, some of the same things that we do on the physical health side too, right? Because um, we know that behavioral health conditions also drive ER utilization. And, you know, is there med adherence rates? Is there lower inpatient utilization? So some of the same metrics that get looked at on the physical health side would matter on the behavioral health side. But you named quite a few. And because value-based care is fairly new on the behavioral health side, and there's a lot of provider practices or entities that specialize in just what they do, right? It's just eating disorders. This is just ABA care. So it'll, the value-based models will have to be defined around that service type. Um, and it's going to be a collaborative effort. It probably will start with upside first with a gradual, so how we, we, we insource behavior health as a plan over the last year and a half, um, and we've you know, built our own network and brought a lot of um, third parties, whether they're virtual care provider groups or virtual and brick and mortar. And what we've done in our contracting is, over the course of five years, we're starting with upside while building a downside by year three and four um, to a bigger downside by year five. Um, but it's been, and, and the model looks very different based on each entity and what they're specializing in. So I don't know if that answered the question, but. If you were here earlier, you might have heard Doug Nimichek, our chief medical officer for behavioral health. For the Cigna Enterprise, behavioral health sits in Evernorth. And through the Evernorth, um, through Evernorth and the Evernorth Research Lab, we are starting to actually look at data and analytics around behavioral health performance and what those metrics should be. In January of this year, we signed a very large client that offers services worldwide. If you like to get things fast in the mail, they'll get it to you. <laughs> and they pushed us in terms of how can you tell me that for a behavioral health condition, that what the provider yielded resulted in a better outcome for the patient. And that is where we are in terms of really drilling down within Evernorth on the metrics that we were looking at going forward. Mm -hmm. 
I'll add one more thing. The other thing that we're looking at in our book is, you know, we had to justify the big investment we made in, in sourcing behavioral health. It's a monstrosity in itself. Um, and it was because we're going to track total cost of care and physical health costs over time. So it's also going to be how has this investment in behavioral health, how has this individual getting the behavioral health help that they need and the treatment that they need impacted their overall physical health costs? So are they actually taking their diabetes meds now? Are they actually, um, you know, are the A1Cs getting better? Um, all, those, all those parameters around physical health is also something we're looking at, and what's the impact of total cost of, to total cost of care? Thank you for your question. We have just two minutes left, but you've been so patient. What, what's your question for our panelists? Uh, so I'm thinking about uh, family values and that particular care that you were going on anymore. Um, and each one of you is in a different contract, have a different expectation. How do you as peers plan to enable your peer abilities? Because each provider is a single. Like a stars for commercial is is what I anticipate is the only way stars to do it is is going to be and um, I'm oversimplifying it but I I completely feel you uh, that you know you've got ten different pairs and you've got ten different systems through which you're getting data so I think some of the transparency rules some of the um, requirements that are coming from you know CMS and and federal government around data sharing, et cetera, will probably make things easy. But I would, I'd say where it needs to probably go is a set, defined set of metrics that everybody uses. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there um, during my tenure or Dr. McCauley's, but I'd be happy to see it. Yes, we already have built it into our value-based metrics and, and our quality requirements. Um, and we're requiring uh, behavior health um, folks to be screened for behavior health conditions, um, social determinants of health um, challenges at primary care, specialty care, as a part of our quality um, and value-based care models as well. I agree with everything that Dr. Kumar said. The one thing I would add, and I don't want to give away the Cigna secret sauce, <laughs> but I spend a fair amount of time traveling the country talking with provider groups about our very base care arrangement. And one of the things that I heard consistently throughout 2023 was you need to provide flexibility because there may be metrics that are important in New England that are not so important in South Carolina. There may be others important in Houston that may not be as important in Arizona. And we have spent a great deal of time listening. And even though the methodology may not be the same, I think we're gonna end up with the ability to do a couple of things. One, agree on probably a handful of metrics that measure blood pressure, that measure diabetes control, that measure weight control or intervention health equity and mental health. And then there may be a way for, for those other metrics to be accounted for in a geographic manner. So again, not giving away the secret sauce, I think we're headed down the same road. And, and you actually did it, that was a great advertisement for the Blues because we truly believe that care is delivered regionally while leveraged nationally, right? So every market, each blue plan, um, has their value-based agreements with those provider groups, but it's based on what are the challenges in that market and what's needed in that market. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. I think where the dynamic may change is for providers that are coming to the table themselves, they may say that we already have a value-based model with X pair. We want you, Cigna, you know, Blue Cross of Arizona, whoever you're talking to, to work with us in having this, a similar program, you don't have to share the, all the details, but at least have your target metrics be the same so that you're not jumping through different hoops for different pairs. So I, I, I could see that 
providers could be leading that conversation. And I would say most payers are probably going to be open to, if it makes sense and it's logical and it truly drives to you're getting paid for high quality outcomes and a lower total cost of care, um, I don't see folks saying, no, but we want it to be different. That was a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. If there's any questions we missed, um, we do have happy hours. So, Dr. Kumar, you mentioned the glass of wine <laughs> or beverage of choice. So feel free to join us if you'd like. You're more than welcome. But please join me in thanking Dr. Kumar and Dr. McCauley for their expertise. And thank you for your time and questions, too. Thank you all. <laughs>